you're here for a world premiere. I'm sharing data that we've shown no one else in the world. So this is a premiere. Uh, it's not even going to be published until June. Uh, you have a little sneak peek in the material that's on your, um, on your chair. So I want to share with you uh, insights into best practices and sort of set it up a little bit. So I'm the chief marketing officer at Fuse. And uh, Fuse is a global communications company. And so uh, we're able to pull out great data because we're sitting on perhaps one of the greatest databases in the world. Millions and millions of phone calls and chats and sharing and video. We know what people are chatting. We know what countries they're from. We know their gender. We know their age. And so we've anonymized all this data to draw some conclusions. So it's uh, very exciting. So Fuse is all about calling, meeting, sharing, and, uh, and chatting. So we've been researching the future of work for, uh, for a few years now. Just want to give a little summary. It started with the app generation. We saw that there was a new generation of people in the workforce who said, um, I don't like a lot of the tools you have at work. I love my personal communication tools. But once I get to work, I feel like I'm moving into another era. Things are a lot slower. Uh, they don't work as well as a lot of the things in my personal life. Um, they also believe in work from anywhere. And so the idea of a physical office was diminishing quite a bit. Um, and then in the last two years, we've been doing a lot of work with um, interviewing CIOs about their role in digital transformation and also CEOs. So all these, uh, these reports, if you're interested, uh, the data and the conclusions are available at, uh, at Fuse.com. So today, we're here to talk about um, productivity at work and what we've learned from millions and millions of records. So this is the size of the database that our data scientists analyze, about 5 million workers in 50 countries, about 20 million calls, 33 million messages, over a million video meetings. And this is not a survey. This is uh, behavioral data. With a survey, you can understand the why. You can ask people the why. But with actual behavioral data that you're observing data, you have to sort of draw out some of the conclusions. And so we've uh, taken a first pass at some of the conclusions. But definitely, you're going to have your own thoughts about why meetings are longer in certain countries, uh, why video is used in certain countries and not in others. And so uh, that's what I'm going to be sharing uh, today. So first, uh, the future of work is no longer the future. It's here today. If you're like me, uh, we have all this great technology. Um, I love in my car that I can uh, do chats with my kids. They are, they're texting, and I'm using my voice. Uh, we have Alexa. We have Google Assistant. If you haven't seen what Google Assistant can do now, it's not just what's the weather like in London today, but it's can you book me a hair appointment on Wednesday. Have you seen this video uh, that Google Assistant does? So it's pretty extraordinary sort of where it's going. And so this whole idea of automation and humanization. So what is the role in technology? We've read a lot about uh, bots um, and artificial intelligence replacing humans. We're seeing particularly for information workers that it's supplementing work. Uh, journalists, about 20% of journalists have been replaced by bots. About 80% of obituaries are now written by computers. Uh, financial stories are written by computers. And so it's sort of a new age in time, and technology has really taken a front, a front stage here. Um, the gig economy. So it's not just about Uber drivers, is it? It's really about everyone. So it's data scientists and marketers and programmers, and people love the flexibility. And so the question is for you, leading IT, what is your role? To make sure you have a secure infrastructure, and if people want to use their own devices, people want to use their own apps, how do you think about that in the gig economy? And work from anywhere. Um, increasingly, when we interview uh, particularly younger people, it is not a place anymore. It's what you do, not where you go. Uh, where I went to university, um, uh, right now about 20% of their diplomas are granted for people who never step foot on campus. Um, at the Berklee College of Music, which is a jazz music uh, university in Boston, where I'm from, 80% uh, of the graduates are doing it digitally. They never step foot in their campuses in Boston and Valencia, Spain. And so the question is, what is work? Is it a place? Or you can do it from anywhere. Starbucks, you can do it from your home, you can do it from a train. And so when I go on the train, I see more people than ever having phone calls, doing video, and communicating from anywhere. So the world is your office is something that we're hearing more and more. And uh, these are some data from people under 24. Uh, how many people are under 24 in this room? Raise your hand. We wish we were under 24. Um, so it's quite stunning. Uh, so if a company had a policy of work from anywhere, 54% would move, if they didn't, would move to another company. 24% would give up company benefits like health care. They'd take on greater work. They'd take a cut in pay. And they'd pay for their own technology. 
Do some of your companies have a work from anywhere policy? Raise your hand if you have a work from anywhere policy. Yeah, yeah. Um, who, who has a company that's quite strict about we have a physical place and we expect you to be at work every day, which is fine. Yeah, yeah. We're sort of this interesting world. We've seen some companies that went to a work from anywhere policy and it was disastrous. Managers couldn't control what was going on. A lot of this is mindset about are people really working if I can't see what they're doing. Um, but it's just a very new world and certainly people who are the younger generation expect to be able to work from anywhere. Um, we're also seeing that there are more generations in the workforce than ever before. We have very young people, but also people over 70, uh, which is uh, quite surprising now. Uh, our longevity is expected to be you know, in the 80s now, and people are working longer and longer, partly because they need the money, partly because they're able to do it, and they're still very productive. So that's a very unusual mix. We've never had that in a workforce before. We've had two or three generations, but never five generations in, in a workforce. And of course, lots and lots of tools. And so. I don't know about you, but most companies I work for have five to eight different communications tools. We have several different chat tools, several different video conferencing tools. Um, does this resonate with you? I'm sort of looking at the lower right. You know, people use Zoom, people have BlueJean, GoToMeeting, WebEx. Um, you've got maybe your IT team or your developers, uh, you know, have um, Google Hangouts on all day. Other people are slacking all day. You know, I don't know about you, but sometimes I get a message from someone, and a couple hours later, I forget how they reached out to me. <laughs> was it an email, LinkedIn? Was it a text? Was it a phone call? It's gotten very complicated. Um, also, our research has shown that the role of IT has changed quite dramatically. You've always been a trusted operator. People who um, ran uh, the systems uh, and were very forthright about how they ran, and now it's much more about being um, a game changer that you're partnering up with the business and you're making a difference. It's not simply enough anymore to be a great IT organization that is a trusted operator. You can be very proud of being a trusted operator, but being a game changer is really, really make your career. And part of our research on our website is you can, uh, we have interviews with about 25 game changers, CIOs and IT organizations who have really changed the game for their organizations in very fundamental ways. So let's start getting into uh, some of the new research, the premier uh, work that we have. Um, what we've seen is that um, the kinds of technology we have uh, affects um, how we communicate. Devices, young people believe that there's one device they need, and of course that's a smartphone. Um, other people believe that it's the laptop. Um, internet speed matters. Um, you probably know in certain countries there is better uh, infrastructure than in others. Certain buildings have terrible Wi-Fi, for example, so people don't use video quite as much. Um, certain uh, countries that you think are third world countries actually have bypassed copper wire and all sorts of things, and they have the best infrastructure in the world. They're completely geared towards a wireless environment. Uh, demographics matter. Younger people are certainly much more texting, uh, but they're also phoning, much more shorter messages. Um, older people still like email. Um, a lot of companies still have an email culture, which is fine. Um, but what's happened is that the way people communicate is actually creating silos in organizations. Some people are all email all the time. Some people are on these big group messages. Other people are videoing. And so we're seeing organizations that are really in this, this sort of unusual environment where they haven't standardized on a set of tools and it's creating a lot of friction and lack of productivity, productivity in the organizations. Then culture matters. You know, what kind of culture does the CEO and the executive team really set for communicating? Are they sending emails over the weekend? Anybody work for a company where the executive team sends emails over the weekend? Yeah, yeah. Um, do you send emails over the weekend? <laughs> yeah, you do. Um, and then geographic cultures. Uh, what we've learned, and I'll show you the specific data, uh, certain countries, they don't turn on their video cameras. Uh, we interviewed people from these countries, and they're very modest. They have great infrastructure, and they have a broadband capability to video, but they think it's immodest to have their face on a video. So we want to better understand the workforce. Um, Research from CNBC and Bain and Company has shown that uh, meetings generally, and these are physical and digital meetings, are very unproductive. So leaders find about two-thirds of meetings ineffective, uh, and then 15% uh, of company time is spent in meetings. It's about $37 billion, sort of an annual cost in meetings. So we're spending a lot of time in meetings. The data I'm going to share with you are all digital meetings, not physical meetings, digital meetings. First question. Which country has the longest digital meetings? So I had some theories. Anybody have a theory about what that might be? It, it, by the way, it's not a big country that anyone would expect. 
But you have a theory about why they might be longer meetings, and these are um, sort of uh, digital meetings uh, with two or more people, video, or sort of conference calls. Any theories about why meetings might be longer or shorter? Polite introductions. They spend a lot of time saying, hi, you okay? Yes, I'm okay. How's that? Yeah, going? yeah. Uh, that? Cultures that are very polite have very long starts of meetings, and they don't start about nine minutes in. Because everyone's sort of, hey, how you doing? Welcome to the room. Somebody just came in. There's a whole bunch of rituals like that. Um, I don't want to say which countries are more polite than others, but some of the data may show that. But some countries are very uh, genteel, and they do it in a very proper way, make people feel welcome. And so they don't also don't want to start the meeting until everyone's there. That's part of the culture. Um, so, uh, so go figure. Sweden and France have the longest meetings. Um, uh, in the world. Across uh, all countries, the average video or uh, joint call is uh, 39.8 minutes. And one thing we've learned is that when we uh, crawl into people's calendars, and we did, everyone schedules 60-minute meetings. Why do we do this? So one learning is stop cluttering. Maybe you do this already, but um, I have a colleague, and she only schedules our meetings. She can only do seven meetings a day. So I want to get 15 minutes with her but she only has it early in the morning or at night. So best practice is uh, don't clutter your calendar with all 60-minute meetings. Best practice is 25-minute meetings and 50-minute meetings. So you have time between meetings and people don't drop out. I'll show you some of the dropout numbers too. So people are falling out of meetings. The longer the meeting, the more likely they are to disconnect and do something else. And so shorter meetings really work. Uh, next step. Uh, video and screen sharing percentage by country. It's kind of small. I think it's in your handout. But Denmark and Italy lead, and the lowest is in India. I don't know why it would be the lowest in India, video and screen sharing. Any theories why that might be? Could be network. I don't know what the network is like in India, whether they have strong infrastructure or it's spotty or weak. That's really good. That's really, I liked your presentation too. You're from Shell? Yeah. yeah, you did a good job. So that's really interesting because you're talking to teams all around the world and you're exactly right. What we saw is that uh, for meetings very early in the morning, people would turn on the video and at the end of the day, but about time zones, you're right, India is probably in most cases uh, you know, uh, going to US or European time zones, so it could be an off hour. Very interesting. Um, video and screen sharing also create an opportunity for teams to stay connected. It's really a good idea. And as you meet with your teams, keep in mind regional differences. So don't force your team in India who is home and the kids are asleep and it's just not a good time to be having a camera on you know, in their house. Exactly right. Interesting. Uh, the number of countries on meeting length. So the more countries, and it may come back to this idea of introductions, but we've seen that language difficulties. So the more countries who participate in a meeting, the longer the meeting. And so you may want to plan that. And so what we've seen, you should schedule longer meetings when participants are from three or more countries. And part of this has to do with introductions, language difficulties, what did you say, I didn't understand you. So meetings are longer when it's three or more countries. Uh, percentage of meetings attended by age. And these are people who don't show up at meetings. So they're scheduled to join the meeting. And what we see is that when you're young and new in your career, under 24, 82% of the time you show up. When you're old and the more senior person on the team, you don't have to show up quite as much. And so uh, one conclusion is that if you're inviting uh, a more senior person in the organization, you may want to reach out to them and say, um, hey, Brian, uh, we've got a meeting on Friday. Just want to make sure you're going to attend. Because more senior people, of course, there's more uh, pressure on their time. They're pushed into other meetings, emergencies. But uh, the younger people on the team, more junior, they show up. And the more senior people, uh, they don't show up quite as much. So you may want to focus on that. Um, screen sharing and uh, really uh, drives attendance. And it also does something else. Uh, it reduces people multitasking. Not that anyone ever does that. So um, are most people here using, do you have teams that are distributed in multiple countries, most people? Raise your hand if you have teams in multiple countries. 
And is it mostly voice you use or you use video or sometimes you'll share documents? You know, how do you like to work with teams in different countries? Video. Video, yeah. Is, is your mode like video is, is how I like to operate and everybody turn on the camera and that's sort of culturally the norm? Yeah, I strongly encourage don't force it. It becomes the norm. Yeah. But sometimes there's some reason someone needs to do it. You don't shame them or anything. You just, no. you know. But, but you demonstrate that my camera's always on, I'm available. And uh, do other people do that too? Video is sort of, no, you don't do that. No. A half hour organization in India is. Yeah. So right, culturally, it's just not something. Yeah. yeah. I, it's occasionally people do it, but we, we do a lot of also screen share of presentations and document polls, that yes. kind of thing as well. And then you do it on one screen, you don't have room to see the people. And right. The screen sharing is very effective to avoid the multitasking and have higher engagement rates. So if people have to actually look at something and think about it as opposed to just hearing something, uh, they have to stay ready and they can't sort of move off to something else. So they have to take notes and they have to be responsive. Um, don't be that person who uh, you know, has it on mute, the camera's off, and then when they ask you a question, you know, you're just lost. It's just not respectful. So adding screen share drives more engagement and lives its ability to multitask, which happens all the time. Um, I'm sure we've all been on calls where you, you're watching the video, and if they wear eyeglasses, you can see that they're in Facebook or LinkedIn or they're doing something else. <laughs> Have you ever seen that, the eyeglass effect here? Yeah, um, I've never called anybody out in the meeting, but after the meeting I said, um, not a cool thing that people knew that you were just joking around. In one case, they were playing card game you know, during the meeting, and it was very clear in their lenses. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Not a real career-making kind of move there, I guess. So um, uh, video adds to the length of the meeting. Uh, people who have video on uh, increases it by about 14%. Higher engagement rate, uh, people are able to look at each other. We also believe that um, from our work that they're able to call on other people through body language, that the body language makes quite a bit of difference. And very often people who aren't physically in a room, let's say there are five people in one room and then several people are calling in. Um, if you can't see them, you can't see their body language that they want to ask a question and very often uh, they're sort of excluded. So has anybody ever called in to a big company meeting or something where you were the person in another country and you felt like a second class citizen? Yeah, yeah, it happens all the time. Um, uh, or sometimes they're having lunch or making private jokes because 80% are in one room. So as a leader, you really try to make everybody feel the same and video can help do that and you can see the body language when people want to respond to something. Um, early disconnects. This is what I point I was making earlier, that if you schedule a 15-minute meeting, less than 1% of the people leave early. Uh, under 30 minutes, 5.2 leave early. But if it's 90 minutes, half of the people leave early. These aren't meetings that end early. These are people who get the hell out of the meeting because they're not getting value out of it. So don't schedule you know, a length of meeting like that. So some of the best practices um, from our large database is short meetings are much better than longer meetings. Set clear expectations. Hopefully you're sending out some material in advance for people to prepare. Um, start and end on time. Um, and that's part of the cultural norm. My team knows the door shuts and uh, we start exactly on time. Um, the person who heads up sales for our company always says, oh, a few people are straggling in. Let's wait for them. And it just drives me nuts. <laughs> what are you? Are you a start on time person or are you a let's give time for stragglers? You're a straggler? On time. Who's a straggler? It's okay. Yeah. Why are you a straggler? <laughs> What's wrong with you? There's a big counter. Some people have got 60 minutes back to back. So how about if you finish one minute and be there the next minute? Yeah, yeah. I think the key is they shouldn't schedule 50 minutes. You know, in college, it's like 50 minute classes, then you have 10 minutes to get the next class. It's exactly the way it is. So, but uh, yeah, yeah, that's a problem. Um, but it uh, just begets, you know, bad behavior of always starting late, just it happens over again. So I, I think it's important to have a culture. If you do want to start a little bit late, that's okay. But you've got to shut the door and start the meeting, you know, I think at kind of the right time. To yeah. be fair, what our teams would do is we'll go out there three minutes in and up to that time it's okay because you've got to transition. But after three minutes, you're late. I yeah. Start. That's good. That's good. Thank you. Um, so a couple of best practices, just want to share um, some of the conclusions from these data, is that um, 
Uh, understand regional cultural differences. I think that example in India, where it being nighttime, they don't turn the video camera when they just woke up from the, a sound sleep. Um, lead from the top. I think your point is good. Video is always on, but you're not going to enforce it. Doesn't have to be if you don't want it, but that's the way you like to operate. Um, visuals keep people more engaged. So if it's just um, if people are just doing a video call, not as good as sharing of content. So it's a meeting where you can share content. It's going to be more engaging. Gen Z and millennials prefer to talk um, and interact with people. It's not just about chatting. Um, you probably have children who like to chat all the time, but in work they realize that a phone is, is perfectly good, video is good, they're multimodal uh, in a work environment, uh, even though in their personal lives it's mostly about chat. Don't be afraid to pick up the phone for quick updates, but save in-depth discussion for digital meetings. And so phone can be very, very effective, uh, particularly if it's a phone you have on you. Um, a couple years ago, I was uh, taking uh, one of my sons to college, uh, and his dormitory, I noticed that um, the students were removing the desks from the dorm rooms. And I asked my son, Max, what's that about? You know, they want more room. And uh, I asked some of the students, and they said, we don't need a desk. What's a desk? And they said, we don't have any paper, we don't have pens, uh, we don't need a desk. I always thought it was the end of the, the, the desk phone, but for a lot of young people, it's the end of the desk. You really don't need it. Um, and so in their dorm, they could work from anywhere, from their bed, from a sofa, from a chair in the hallway, from the library, from a coffee house, didn't really matter. So don't be afraid to pick up the phone. And then uh, sometimes you have to flex your style based on other people or cultural norms. The example being if there are many countries on a call, you want to have a slightly longer scheduled call. So what it all means uh, from the data, technology is improving collaboration and communication in many, many ways. Um, we can have more distant teams. You can have people who are gig workers and they all participate in a single platform. It is creating some silos because we have so many different communication tools. People don't know where to go for all the data or where someone reached out to me. Um, if you get it right, uh, it can drive employee engagement. So an example is if you want to attract young people who are coders and developers, you probably have to have a work from anywhere policy. Um, and so companies that get it right, it really makes a big difference in productivity. Um, take into account differences uh, by age and cultures. Uh, good technology isn't enough. Um, employees who um, understand their preferences, um, if you understand them, they're much more likely uh, to help you uh, when they're heard and supported. So coming next month is a uh, very in-depth analysis. I just wanted to give you a little sneak peek. This is the world premiere of some of these data, millions and millions of records. We're going to have a lot more uh, in terms of um, what it all means for people. Uh, but it's a very interesting record of changes that are happening. We're also going to be benchmarking this over time, see how um, the use of digital technologies for communication uh, is changing. So thank you. Um, good participation here as well. I uh, really like that. Um, any questions? Yes. Um, what would you do with the main tools problem that face a lot of companies today? How would you tackle that yourself? Um, I would probably talk to the business leaders. You know, you guys do this all the time. <laughs> And uh, the research um, from CIOs that are very effective is um, pushing technologies down from the top is no is the best idea. You want to talk to business people about what they're using and seeing what's there. Um, so we've seen companies standardize on fewer things being a really good idea. But if there is a group using Slack and engineering, it's going to be very difficult to push them onto a standardized you know, tool. We see having fewer ways of communication uh, better than others. And the other thing is, where are the leaders communicating? So if you get a particular communications tool and no one's using it, and so what we've learned from these big projects where they've, let's say they've moved off a legacy PBX system and they move to global communications, if the adoption rates are low, then it's a failure. So a big part of IT is not just getting the technology, but improving the adoption rates. And it's really about being change agents, and these are change projects. One thing is about communication, unlike most apps that you buy, is that it's wall to wall. Everybody uses it. And what we've heard is that um, it also can be very threatening to your job. You know, if your CEO is having a board call on a platform that you chose, and suddenly he can't hear, and the call quality is not good, and the video looks bad, and people are frozen like this, um, that's on you. 
And so if, if it's a financial application that's down for a couple of minutes, you can live with that. You know, if it's an ERP application and, it, you know, people have issues. But if you're choosing uh, the communications one, it really is critically important to everyone. So that's why I think in the choice, you have to do a lot more consensus building around the organization, not push it down. Otherwise, you can get blown up if there's some outages. People really have to buy into the new technology. And I would talk to business leaders about that. Great. Yes? I'm curious if you have any data on the type of content that's shared. So the reason I'm asking is if it's textual content, content that you're sharing, then you're acti actually distracting people from listening to you, right? Because you can only do one thing at once. You can either read it or you can listen. Yeah. And if they both say at the same time, your recall is worse than if you have one at a time. So, yeah. Um, we haven't dug into that yet. We're seeing uh, basically there's two kinds of content that's shared. The kind that is presented, like a movie, like here are the slides to pr impart education, knowledge. And the second half is really, you really want collaboration. So uh, content sharing, you know, Fuse, for example, allows you to like circle things, edit in line, so people feel more sense of their collaborating. So content sharing is interesting. You know, it's actually for most cases, 80%, it's content presenting. <laughs> I'm presenting you this content. I'm sharing it with you, but there's no back and forth. And so we've seen the best levels of engagement is where it actually is something that you need help with, and you're editing in real time and making changes in real time. Hope that's helpful. Thanks, Dave. Great. You mentioned like, it is a good assistant for comparing points or something, but we're talking about meetings. Is it, yeah, we're going to virtual assistant, you can like listen to the meeting and go, okay, that's, a, that's an action. Yeah. Yeah. Put that in your yes, that's where it's headed. That's where it's headed. Yeah, more, uh, it's mostly in beta, a lot of these things. So the, the first one is, is that um, uh, you can crawl through, uh, for salespeople, for example, you can actually uh, record uh, calls and see what words they use, competition, and see which salespeople are hitting quota, which are not, and you can use it as a learning. Here's a good call to have. Here are the things to say or not say. Um, we're seeing it as follow-up after a meeting. So you, it can, uh, natural language processing, it can listen to the call, turn it into text, and then understand what the to-dos were, if it's very clear, and give that to the, the person who ran the meeting. Um, we think that's gonna be automated uh, very soon, um, and there's a lot of technology that seems to get it right about 60% of the time. Um, unfortunately, it's not nearly 100% of the time yet, and so there are all these like things that happen wrong. I'll give you one example. Has anyone ever been in a uh, driverless car, autonomous car? Um, I spent a lot of my time, great. Um, where did you do that? That's where I did mine too. So it's very interesting. So I was in an autonomous car um, in California on the uh, 101 or the four, 101, which is the main one up and down Silicon Valley. And I'm in the car and it's just amazing. A lot of traffic getting on the ramp and everything. And then I read that all the tests for all these autonomous cars are in California. And all the monitors and sensors don't understand what snow is, what snow is. And so when they started doing these cars in the East Coast, they thought snow was a a hard barrier. You can't go over even two inches of snow. And so they had to reprogram it all. And so uh, there are all these things that happen in real life. And so I think um, uh, crawling through the meeting content, coming out with the key points and the to-dos, the next steps, I think that's gonna happen in the next few years. We're seeing it all the time. And I think the Google Assistant make your hair appointment. Uh, so um, what it does is actually goes into your calendar and sees what your hair salon is and who you book with. It also knows what time of day it makes the outbound call for you. And have anybody heard this call on YouTube? It's quite remarkable. Yeah, it's the most stunning thing imaginable. And it gets oohs and ahs out of the audience. And uh, so it's in beta right now. So I think that's gonna happen uh, with meetings.